welcome back. We will discuss what is happening in DeFi, what's going on. We will explore together why DeFi is a paradigm shift in the financial industry as we know it today. All right, Andre, and uh, welcome to On DeFi and uh, Wrecked Television. So today we're, uh, I invite you in, uh, in this beautiful building uh, in the heart of Amsterdam. And it's convenient that we both live in Amsterdam. We know each other for, for some time now. And uh, we've been talking a lot about like crypto, decentralized finance, even before it was like a, a hype, right? So we've been communicating. Andre, you were also on the... Uh, DeFi 201, where you explained uh, to us what hedge funds are, what yep. uh, interest rate swaps are, and how you're implementing this in Opium Protocol. But who is Andre? Maybe tell, start off and tell a little bit about, your, about yourself. And thank you once again to uh, take the time to come uh, on, on the show, on Rack Television and uh, on DeFi. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say about yep. Opium. A little bit, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Amadeo. A little bit about myself. Uh, I was a trader, bond trader and fund manager. I used to mm -hmm. trade a lot of derivatives uh, for my, most of my professional life. And that was pretty cool. I liked it a lot. Uh, before that, even before that, I used to be a mathematician. And uh, back in Russia, I had a mathematical career uh, mm -hmm. pretty seriously. But then I moved into the finance, into the business. And mm -hmm. I end up in uh, trading bonds, fund managing, I manage uh, hedge funds and rates, and that was all cool uh, okay. until uh, we invested in Ethereum and we were investing in several uh, different things, uh, okay. fintech, uh, Bitcoin a little bit, but also Ethereum, and uh, that changed my life. So I, we stay with Ethereum, we develop uh, mm -hmm. from day one, we stay with community, and it's, it's, it's all pretty interesting. And uh, three years ago, we started to build uh, Protocol. Not a, it was not a protocol back then. Uh, we were starting to build derivatives for uh, better uh, for, the, for the financial system, but yeah. much better derivatives, much uh, cheaper derivatives, and so on. It was no DeFi, so we didn't build for DeFi. We built for the real uh, or what is real now, for the traditional. Traditional financial, financial uh, system, because I think uh, decentralized can be more real very soon. So. Yeah, so basically you, you started building for the decentralized uh, ecosystem, or for the centralized ecosystem, which for like, hey, I, I, I work in finance and I see this, this, this ledger where I can like store financial data and have a security layer, and hey, that's interesting, start building it. And then you, you pivoted more now towards decentralized protocols, right? Or are you still also doing centralized uh, I, I don't think it is a big difference, centralized, decentralized, because mm -hmm. at the end you should have the better product, you should have a uh, yeah. use case, right? Mm -hmm. We're not building it because it's decentralized. So, okay. But indeed, back then, uh, three years ago, we've seen, I was working in the financial sector, I've seen how inefficient it can be. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's, it is the biggest sector in the uh, global economy. So, and the idea was to do something better. Mm -hmm. And exotic derivatives, uh, they are pretty expensive and uh, it's a legal disaster. If you want to build something uh, which is exotic, you're going to pay lawyers till, till you run out of money probably. Mm. And we were solving, solving this problem. We saw the blockchain, Ethereum, pretty exciting. And then it came into the protocol and then a protocol is, uh, from day one, protocol is composable, let's say, with the traditional financial system. Yeah. But now it's also composable with DeFi because there is a DeFi and we are very happy about DeFi. We think yeah. it's uh, pretty cool. However, I can criticize DeFi a lot. I think yeah, it's all, it, it has a lot of problems, but it's yeah. problems of growth. It's not a problem like it's, it's, it's uh, stagnation. No, it's, uh, it's growing too fast and it has a lot of problems and we all yeah. need to solve it, basically. That's, that's my, how I feel about it. Yeah, so basically, I yeah, sort of, and then the, the protocol is now also being used by the art exchange. It's also a project yep. uh, from you. At the, all the links to all the projects that we mentioned, like Opium or Art Exchange, will all be in the description uh, below. And Art Exchange also uses the, the foundation that you built for Opium Protocol. Right? Correct, correct. Yeah. So we build a protocol. Opium Protocol is a layer where everybody mm -hmm. can build. Yeah. So you can build it as well if you want some uh, derivatives. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we are the first one to build on top of it and to show, hey, this is a use case, this is a use case. So we build different commercial applications. Uh, what you mentioned, uh, the art exchange is mm -hmm. a joint venture between us and another partner. They're very big in art. They uh, know everything about art and I have no clue about art. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the, the joint venture idea. And we built Opium Exchange, so operate different things. 
Uh, how would I describe, not to make uh, long stories uh, or about the protocol, mm -hmm. we built something like ecosystem which is composable with traditional finance but also with the DeFi at the same time. And you can build really fast, it's a matter of one, two hours to build on top of the protocol uh, new derivative. Once you build it, you have a ticker, so it's like unique uh, identifier, unique ID, mm -hmm. which you uh, can see directly the order book for it, order so on so on. And you have a short and long position if you buy it. Pre pretty much the, the same like everything else. And yeah. we have a good balance between uh, Bloomberg type of uh, system and DeFi. So we're now going to go actually much more uh, better in UI, UX and UI. Mm -hmm. So, but we're balancing basically. Yeah, that's great. And I also saw yeah, you built your own ERC standard as well for like the options that are created on the Opium Exchange. And that this is. And this will evolve over time. So it's an evolving protocol, uh, but it's a foundation for an, uh, something like an art exchange or other products, but because art exchange is also your own product, but uh, everybody can basically use Opium Protocol, the base layer, and uh, build their own uh, financial, financial derivatives and systems. That's really cool. And you, and you use the Ethereum as a base layer, and why do you choose uh, Ethereum as your 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 sinking layer? Yeah. That's it's actually very interesting what you talk about. So we use Ethereum as a settlement layer. Settlement layer, yes. And that's our philosophy. That's a gorgeous choice from day one. And we don't because we don't believe that Ethereum should be something else than a settlement layer. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much a smart settlement, but it's it is settlement. Uh, what what I mean by this uh, that it's. We think it's wrong to make automatic market making, risk management, so on, so on, on a layer one, on a blockchain. We mm -hmm. think, well, it, it was a good uh, starting point. It was good when we have a unique You settle, well. you settle on the base layer, right? You settle we settle, yeah, yeah, we settle. But uh, market making with us is done on a, another layer. So mm -hmm. it's a zero X or type of order books with meta yes. transactions. And we can run there 100 market makers. Not one market maker like Uniswap, but we can run 100. And this is pretty interesting. Uh, if you allow me, maybe I, I explain yes, this, this, this idea because this is uh, something which uh, I think uh, everybody will accept at, at mm -hmm. some point. And I was working again uh, like 10 years in a traditional finance. Yes. And that's, that's, I have this strong view uh, where DeFi should go, how architecture should be. Yes. So basically uh, we had Uniswap and it's pretty cool I think uh, to have Uniswap aggregating liquidity and uh, having liquidity all the time uh, however it's uh, done on chain on the, on the blockchain so it's not gas efficient uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't take information from the real uh, market into account mm -hmm. so it's not informed let's say if something mm -hmm. happened uh, in the world it doesn't know so it's just automatically giving the price and so on so on so, and people sometimes confuse it with the market. They say there, there is a market, but the market is not uh, a market maker. The market is uh, an order book, mm -hmm. saying uh, very short. Why mm -hmm. I, I say so? Because uh, there, in a real world, there are many market makers. Yes. So if a market maker is going to take information into account, it's going to outperform the uh, in, uninformed market maker. So if I build a Uniswap which uh, knows about the price drops and stuff like this, then uh, this one going to uh, outperform uh, Uniswap very easily. But also if I build something, uh, some market maker who take a risk on top of it, like mm -hmm. saying, okay, Ethereum not going to go more than 30% uh, a day and so on, so on, and that's how I build my market making strategy, it's going to outperform both of them. So and so on, so on. So there mm -hmm. are a lot of strategies, and it's called alga trading. It's mm -hmm. called market making. You can, you can call it differently, but uh, all of them, they basically have a right to exist, and they have different risk return profiles. Yes, those market makers. And in real finance, and in real world, they speak to each other through the order books, because mm -hmm. the order book is a, a bottleneck of the financial system. Yes. You cannot have hundred orders and hundred orders, and then you match them uh, among each other. You need to have an order. So mm -hmm. this order comes comes first, and this order comes second, and yes. that's that's natural. You cannot; uh, it's always a line, mm -hmm. and that's why I have order book, and uh, nothing better than order book was invented, and that's that's the thing. So what I what I'm uh, explaining that uh, it should be order book, 
and it should be different uh, participants, uh, different market makers, but also hedge funds, but mm -hmm. also just natural hedgers, uh, retail, and so on, so on. And the order book is the source of truth, and it is a market. Yes. The market maker is not uh, a market. Market is order book, which can be accessed by different strategies, so on, so on. That's how it's done in uh, investment banking, in uh, traditional finance. And I think that's where we go with the DeFi, because we see a lot of signals. Uh, Serum is building like this. Uh, Kyber Network recently said they're going to make order books, kind of, kind of order books on top of Uniswap and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I want to emphasize, uh, and sorry we directly jump into it yeah. so, no, for the introductions ahead. and so go on. Ahead, but that's one, one of the things uh, I think it's important uh, in an architectural point of view for the DeFi. Because then uh, it's going to be more market makers, more strategies, and it's going to be more scalable as well. Mm -hmm. and, and the order book will be then settled on the layer zero, like Ethereum, or is the order book also a... Exactly. So yeah. the settlement can be done on the, on the Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's my belief. Uh, and the actual order book doesn't need to be on Ethereum. So we, we run it on the meta transactions, just like 0x protocol. Yeah. And our order books are as fast as any order book. Basically, we don't have limitation. The set, we have a bottleneck in the settlement because every transaction should be settled on a uh, Ethereum blockchain and you should have a long position, should have a short position, mm -hmm. it should be minted and so on and so on. But uh, order book can be anywhere, can be on Solana, uh, can be on uh, Near Protocol, can be anywhere else. And yeah. we're exploring this ZK Labs, pretty promising. Uh, but the settlement uh, probably going to happen in Ethereum, and why I say so, because even uh, companies now want to use Ethereum mainnet as a settlement layer. So it's, it's kind of like everybody trusts it, and this is a layer for everyone. But if it's a layer for everyone, and we want to build significant financial system on it, it's not going to be scalable if we do market making, uh, no. risk management, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. That's that clear. will be on layer two, and layer... The, the, how I see it is like Ethereum is the layer zero and it may be, there's another blockchain that will become layer zero. I don't know, but at this point in time, the layer with the most zero trust that you don't have to trust it because you know it will operate and it will function as it says it's functioning, right? So that's why I think uh, Ethereum will stay layer zero. And uh, I, when I look at the developments, looking very promising, and with sharding, I think you will get their own financial shards per protocol. And on top of that, yeah, zero X layers, and I'm going down like that. That is uh, really cool, and that's also how Opium is, is, is constructed. So it was a long introduction, and and yeah, you're you're uh, basically yeah, you, you said you studied uh, in uh, Russia, and then you came to to Amsterdam. You invested in Ethereum in the in the ICO, right? Uh, yep. So you were ICO investor in Ethereum. Then uh, you started. You saw opportunities, start building, opened, uh, opened your eyes. Um, yeah, and now you, uh, we, we, you now can trade options on a decentralized matter, right? Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you see that uh, evolving and how do you, do you see a, a future where uh, financial systems, uh, like more traditional financial systems will also move to an opium-like structure or maybe move to opium? Uh, is it faster already than traditional financial infrastructure or is there still a very long way to go before we have that same efficiency that some Well, the efficiency uh, will, will come, I think, mm -hmm. because it's improving. And if you look one year ago, two years ago, so uh, in terms of Oracle, stable coins, on-ramp, off-ramp, awareness, uh, size of the sector, number of players, mature players. All improved yeah. uh, over the last year or last two years dr dramatically and the genie is out of the bottle yes so you cannot put it back so we already know that it's going to be possible to have really cool solutions uh, for exotic derivatives uh, for uh, cheaper faster and uh, trustless mm -hmm. so we already know it and even if we all stop now somebody else is going to do it so this is yeah. pr 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 pretty cool because we see advantage yes so it's the more efficient way of organizing us as humans together. So as humans yep. uh, and transferring value to different systems, it's more efficient to do that on a blockchain. So it will it will happen in the future, no matter what. Right? I, I, th I think so, yes. And nice. uh, let me come to risks, because I, I said I can be critical about DeFi as well. Yes. So the risks, uh, while we go there, is going to be some financial crisis in DeFi. Uh, and 
the reason we don't have a regulation, uh, we don't have any regulation now, it's very, very basic regulation, and uh, that's the, that will cause financial crisis, I think. Because my point on regulation, that mm -hmm. when you have thousands of different regulations, uh, which makes uh, your life horrible, like in, in certain sector of traditional financial system, it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. But if you have Wild West and you have no rules and uh, no standards, it's also pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So, and it should be certain amount of regulation. I think regulation is good as long as it's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. So, and in, 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 uh, I, I watch a lot, uh, bankers I watch a lot or uh, Defiant. And there, uh, there is an analogy like the, the God of Moloch and it's like the God of human coordination. And it's like, I see Ethereum as a more efficient way as humans to organize ourselves, right? Exactly. But the governments don't really like us moving too fast because they want to get, of course, their taxes or their, they want to have their influence in, in, in certain markets. But as humans, as free humans, we can do free trades. If I want to do an option on a nice art piece, for example, on the art exchange, I shouldn't, you know, that should be possible for me to, to do something like that. If I want to do that in the traditional financial world, it would be a lot of headaches, I, I, I believe, right? Right. Because you need to do all these regulations. So basically, by having this technology, it makes us humans organize ourselves more efficient. And I feel that gov yeah, governments should support that. So as we, we can repeat that, that's the same as the internet, we, we are more efficient, we are uh, more, uh, individuals can be more private with their financial, uh, with their finances. Um, so we can re keep repeating that. But the state, of course, there's also a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of risk that a lot of normal people don't see. But do the governments need to spend money to protect people that don't see the risks? Or well, how do you see that then with regulation? Okay, uh, two questions, two, two, two points. Yeah. Uh, on the first point, uh, you say we organize ourselves better with the blockchain, which is uh, completely true because we don't need to uh, have uh, legal contracts. We don't need to have yeah. 500 pages on, on uh, legal stuff explaining what is derivative and so on and so on. It's pretty cool. And suppose it's going to grow. So it's, it's uh, a lot of people, they organize themselves and that's, they, they, they need to have certain rules that that's exactly what government is doing. So it's not, mm -hmm. I'm not saying, we're not opposing government and uh, this innovation. Mm -hmm. I think it is on, a, on the same side of the table because the government, why, why, why do we need the government, uh, government, government uh, to help us to be organized and to have uh, clear rules uh, I would challenge that, that everybody is benefit. Bene benefit. I think we can have governance without government. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds cool. But uh, let's see how that evolves. I don't that know. sounds cool. I don't know how that will evolve. But what what I see now in England, uh, there is this regulations passed that making basically the 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 people of England are now not. Uh, uh, in 2020, 2021, in January, they will not be allowed anymore to buy uh, complex uh, derivatives where uh, crypto... Okay, you go, you go to the second part of your, of your question. Yeah. Because my my yes. first point yes. was that actually uh, gover government was created in order that we all benefit. It's kind of social agreement. Uh, okay, everybody allowed to have a gun, for example, and then uh, everybody start to shoot each other, and then government say, okay, guys, no, it's not uh, possible. We have clear rules. Yes. You can have a gun still, but we don't uh, shoot each other. And then everybody benefits. So, mm -hmm. uh, and all the uh, idea about the government, it's, it's mathematically, it's a game theory, mm -hmm. that we uh, sacrifice a little bit, each of us, but then the mutual benefit is uh, tremendous. So that, that's an idea. So, uh, but coming to the second part of your of your question, uh, that uh, government government should or should not uh, explain the risks to the people. I think it should, because uh, I was studying half of my life uh, to, to to know how to trade derivatives, options, and so on, and that's pretty complex. Yeah. So and uh, people. Like my mother, she, uh, of course, uh, thinks differently about it. And even the concept of risk return, not a lot of uh, people know about it. And uh, when they see return, they don't think about risk in the, f the first place. So how professionals, professional traders think, they think risk return. 
So you can speak about return without uh, speaking about risk. Yes, it's it's, it's the same uh, the same thing basically. Yeah. So and then uh, okay, the risk it's, is it correlated? Is it uh, isolated? Is it uh, this and that that? So that's how we think, and uh, we need to study a lot to be able to work in this industry. But uh, people should be educated. I'm not sure. I'm not saying that it should be prohibited. Uh, but uh, it should be education and they should know their risks and they should know consequences. Yeah, I completely agree with that. But, so, yeah, I completely agree. So it's more efficient, but people uh, should be educated and we should all like level up. We should exactly. level up our knowledge and our skill sets as a humanity. We need to understand that maybe it's for some functions we don't need a centralized bank and some people will understand that. They will act and they will form communities and these communities probably maybe will be stronger, right? Or more wealthier. Yeah. Um, and they should be able to do whatever they want. But what's happening now in England, in England, they're blocking people from buying derivative or complexer crypto project from centralized exchanges, right? So they're saying, if you're uh, dealing with these products, it's not allowed. You're, you're basically, uh, it still needs to see how they're going to enforce it, how the exact detail, I don't know. It's very new, it's very new information. Did you hear about this, this information? Yeah, yeah. I, I hear, I see the trend and uh, BitMEX, of course, the, the uh, yeah, they're, England. But BitMEX is too much. They, they went too far with their coconut exactly. uh, story. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, at, at the same uh, time, the genie is out of the bottle. You cannot prohibit decentralized uh, governance, decentralized protocols, and uh, you may not like compound, but if it's decentralized now, so you need to deal with it. And right. uh, I yeah. think actually a regulator is uh, quite helpful, at least in America, you see a lot of consistent good signals, and uh, yeah. th 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 that's going to be fine. But again, just uh, talking about derivatives, it's probably the most uh, risky instruments in the financial system. Yeah. So. Uh, can you, can you fly a plane if I give you a plane? No, I can try, but I will not succeed. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I can, I can uh, fly a little bit of plane uh, nice. and I can tell you derivatives are much more complex. So if you're nice. not going <laughs> to fly a plane, uh, but you want to try to trade derivatives, uh, putting significant risk, I think it's not consistent. Yeah, okay, so we need, you say uh, you, you're building now a better user interface so your, the user interface will display the risks more transparently that are involved with using the or yeah, because you're making basically uh, a plane then that's more accessible for the retail people I guess yep. and, and, and so far it's a sandbox right so far mm -hmm. whole DeFi is sandbox yeah. uh, 10 billion is nothing from the financial uh, system it's nothing the market of uh, derivatives Global derivatives is one million times bigger still. Yeah. So just derivatives, not talking about credit money, anything else. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing, it's, it's a sandbox. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we're all trying uh, to see uh, how it may work. And through the financial crisis, through the flash loans, through the hacks, the system becomes more mature and more robust. That's basically... Anti-fragile, right? Nassim Taleb. Yeah. So love, love him. Yeah. It's an anti DeFi is an anti-fragile system. Then. Not yet, but uh, not yet. It should be. Okay. It should be, and uh, all the all the things, uh, small crashes will help. Yeah. Oh, it's not yet anti-fragile. You say it's still very fragile. So it's. It it it, it is uh, very fragile, uh, but the quality of the system of, of anti-fragility, of course, is there. So yes, the, the more the more crises we have, the more small uh, crashes we have, the better it become. Also, with regulation. People also will understand that regulation is needed mm -hmm. and certain level of protection is needed. Yeah. So maybe it's too much. Yeah. So uh, I have a friend that, that he he was uh, investing a lot when he was a kid. Uh, and in Holland here, it was uh, possible for him, being 15-year-old uh, guy, to buy uh, shares, equities. Oh. And he's pretty successful uh, because he started uh, very early, he understood the risks, he understood the concept, and now he has own kids and they wanted to buy shares, but it's prohibited because they're not 18, because it's risk and so on and so on. And he was uh, complaining uh, that uh, what kind of risk it is if they invest uh, $100 
which they earn over the summer yeah. into the shares and they learn how it works. It's amazing. It's, it's not risky. It's actually pretty it's good educational experience. Pretty yeah. good, good, good education because otherwise you don't learn. And yeah, maybe regulation uh, comes too much on certain points. Uh, maybe not. You can argue, but I think in general, I think regulation is good. Yeah. Okay. And then where, where do we need uh, now in DeFi? Uh, we saw a, a lot of really weird things happening, like a, so, a lot of like sushi swap, vampire attacks. Um, so much to talk about, but like. There, there is a lot of risks in there. So, you, you, where do regulators need to step in your, in your opinion? Where can regulation be good? I, I think I see it, I see regulation as a it's like a highway, and you we're driving on a car, and yeah, of course you're not going to drive like this, right? So, eventually you need to drive in one lane and keep building a better system. And I think regulations are pushing us on the lane. That sh should be like that, right? But I think um, now regulations are still kind of. Yeah. Nowhere. Yeah. So, what I think, but I think, what you look at the traditional financial system, the regulations are really making the car drive slower, or making the the road slower for innovation, right? But now in DeFi, it's all still open. And where do regulations need to come in? Where do regulations need to? I'm not. I'm not the best person on regulations. So no. Okay. Uh, we speak uh, a lot about it, but uh, yeah. I think it's because it's very small. The, the, the DeFi is very small, very so small. it's okay. It can happen a lot of crashes and stuff. It's okay. Yeah. So, but it, if it's going to be significant, it should be this lane. So you should drive on the lane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you should not uh, crash into other cars as well. And we basically to to get that done, we because it's still all very experimental. So we need to talk to more lawyers, regulators, and have them in this discussions like this and then openly talk about what is going on and how can we solve that yeah so let's let's spark that discussion for when maybe with a lawyer no, but, or a but also i think we should uh we should be responsible and put some uh self-regulation maybe in place mm. because we can ag agree on the standards at least so yes uh people invest and uh, invest i don't know people put their crypto uh money in, into certain projects but they don't have a, even an idea about historical volatility of this and uh, about potential risks. And if we have at least a standard which is disclosing it, it's already a, a big job. Yeah, that's what we're trying, uh, not the standardization, but with direct television, we have like a newsletter, and then we really go in depth into certain, uh, you know, uh, into certain crashes and certain uh, rug pulls that happens. Yeah. Uh, actually from also legitimate players in the space who are involved in some very shady things in DeFi, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but overall, yeah, it's growing and uh, self-regulation. I think it's not really possible, but like uh, to a certain extent. I don't uh, know. Well, uh, you see. But I do hope. Uh, I I think it's, I, I think I believe actually just completely free markets. Also, the building where we're now at, right? This uh, old building from the financial minister of Netherlands uh, during the golden age. They called the age of freedom, where trade was really free. So there was really free trade. They start trading with everybody. Uh, no religion blockages because it was also opener for like religious at that time that was so they, they let everything more open and then the, the city started to flourish right yeah but freedom doesn't mean that uh, people can start to kill each other of course not of course not that's what it was famous I think Larry King was saying this that uh, freedom of speech is not equal to starting uh, to shout in the over full cinema like there is a fire there is a fire uh, it's, it's not a freedom of speech so it's something else and freedom is also something else than just uh, doing all the Ponzi schemes and uh, yeah. crazy stuff, right? I agree with that. So and that's, that's the point. We need a uh, certain uh, self-regulation, regulation yeah. or something. We need to agree on something. We need to point them out. So the people that I, wreck I, other people, we need to just point at them, show them who they are, what they did. And that let's not repeat that, right? So, like, but, uh, maybe, yes, but uh, on your point that uh, it's, it's difficult to have self-regulation, I think it's very easy to have self-regulation. Okay. Look, look at Ethereum. So, and Ethereum is a big community which is uh, self-regulated. So where yes. is Ethereum Classic? So, and where is Ethereum? Because of mm -hmm. all the community. Yes. And uh, that, that, that's a lot of good examples already. Uh, just not the time to think about risks because it was no significant financial crisis. Yeah. And I think it's better if the DeFi financial crisis happened faster. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be less uh, money in a pot and uh, less losses, uh, the crash is going to be smaller. Yeah. Uh, but then everybody starts to think, okay, uh, it cannot continue like this because otherwise we're going to run into another crash. Let's make certain rules. Make let's make certain uh, reasonable uh, regulations uh, just just for the community. That's yeah, I'm and I, I think now already we saw like a small hype cycle in, in DeFi. People are saying we're in the 
really big hype cycle. I think we saw this first small hype cycle and now we're, we're going down. I think, in my opinion, there's another big hype cycle for DeFi coming. What do you think? Or you think we're, we're now in the, we're gonna slow down a little bit and then gonna go in another hype cycle? What, what is your opinion? No, I think it's, it's, it's coming. I think uh, the potential uh, is huge, enormous. And I think we're now mm -hmm. standing be, be, uh, in front of something very significant, uh, a lot of banks, a lot of companies, uh, real sector is investing, uh, they're interested, they are uh, experimenting or already applying certain solutions. And if you look at, again, the, the uh, size of the financial sector and uh, mm -hmm. how inefficient it is, so it's, it's like you just need a small trigger a lot, of, a lot of good stuff. It's gonna explode. Yeah, it can explode. And we need some like real world. I, I always think that we will see a real DeFi boom when people start to understand and the uh, 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 like uh, more this derivatives products that will also uh, connect with uh, real world assets like what you're doing with Art Exchange, for example, or Centrifuge is doing with uh, invoice financing. And I think when those things will take off, I think we see a lot of money that from the outside coming into DeFi uh, because it's just more efficient, right? Because it's cheaper. And the, it's the cheaper. money is the best argument. So you can try to convince to use uh, blockchain, uh, like you can try to convince my mother, but if you explain her that it's cheaper, yeah, that's the main argument basically. It's cheaper, it's faster. Yeah. But like in invoice financing, so it's a good example and I like what the guys are doing. Yeah. Uh, the, the working capital gap uh, in Europe is financed sometimes at 20% uh, per year IPA uh, and with zero interest rates. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm not, I don't remember the, the last numbers, but at least uh, a few years ago, it was the case when I was working in financial system yeah. and it's, it's, it's very inefficient. So, because you know that it's a working capital gap, so the company doesn't have money right now, mm -hmm. but company has money, assets and so on, so on. However, it's 20% because it's not an efficient market. Yeah. Talking about art, uh, collectors, they, art co uh, collectors, they have uh, liquidity problems mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. normally they buy uh, art for the old spare money <laughs> yes, yes, and then they need liquidity and uh, they cannot get this liquidity. Well, they can get this liquidity uh, and the uh, cost of it is 10% is, is considered to be good. Mm. So if I have a Rembrandt uh, artwork, which costs 5 million, I can get 2 million. So uh, cash for it, against it. So it's very conservative valuation, uh, overvalued. And then I pay 10%. If I pay 10% per year, I'm lucky to have mm -hmm. this uh, great line. And this is also pretty inefficient. And it takes a long time to set that up, I think, right? Uh, a lot of documents, yeah, also, yeah. a lot of headaches. Now, uh, I went to the art exchange, it looks pretty beautiful. And it's basically, you can uh, list it and there's an, 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 somebody comes to your... Uh, it's still a, a MVP, right? But if in, in let's say it's uh, like in two years and it's a mature product, I like here I have uh, this uh, beautiful art uh, piece here. I say, hey, you can buy a piece of it or something. I don't know, and then I can just uh, there, there will be a taxeur, so uh, like a tax, somebody that uh, sees how, how much what is the value evaluation of it? Yeah. evaluation. Yeah, somebody will evaluate it, make a photo of it. It will be signed in documents. Okay, and then it will be synced on the blockchain, and then people will start trading with it, and they on the secondary market yeah. on the secondary market. But also get mm -hmm. uh, a loan against it, and, and so on. Get so a on. loan against it, and normally these kind of financial lines or these kind of financial hubs, you can only exit this if you're a completely regulated financial institution. But now you can just be somebody that has maybe. 10, well, you, you still need to be regulated to buy the piece of uh, fine art, uh, but it's, it's just normal KYC ML procedures uh, okay. are there and that, that's pretty much it. The regulator doesn't uh, require any more. And if I provide liquidity, I don't need any KYC, right? Uh, depend, uh, but normally you can provide liquidity just in, in crypto, that, that's it. So basically this piece of art can be uh, a MakerDAO CDP. So if we have MakerDAO, if we have like exactly. a call that, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, MakerDAO can use real world objects like piece of art, piece of That's why I said what Centrifuge is Centrifuge, doing yeah. uh, is pretty cool because it will also bring more collateral uh, to DeFi, to the blockchain uh, startups. It's currently only one collateral, crypto. Yeah. And we built on top of it everything. 
So if it's going to be also art, if it's going to be invoices, if it's going to be penetration into the real economy, let's make it pretty strong because those risks are not correlated. If crypto goes down, art doesn't go down and uh, so on. It's going to be a very, very strong system. That would be amazing. Yeah, right now I feel uh, we're a little bit with this whole uh, fruit farming stuff. And especially now with the vampire attacks from Tron or Binance Smart Chain and stuff like that, what I feel is just we're moving tokens around to each other and some people get screwed on it. Yep. They get rock pulled and that's why the other people get interest. The, and, it's called zero sum game, yeah, basically. Yeah. So I think it's very, very If it's not connected to the real economy, it's going to be a zero sum game. If yeah. you're going to put money uh, somewhere with you, uh, if you win and lose. So that's the thing. Yeah. We need to be connected to the real economy and uh, through different channels, not for, for only like crypto well, channel or art channel, but through many channels. And then it's going to be part of it and it's also going to solve problems on the real economy. Yeah, it's going to be bigger, but I would challenge that a little bit because I think there will there's also value, of course, in, in blockchain. Uh, for example, PyDAO, they have like ETFs on, on the blockchain and they create index funds and there's value in there because people want to invest in these fund and indexes and they will pay a little bit of money on that so then the yeah. protocol itself will also generate value but of course this is a very small value compared to what real world assets or real art or real uh, invoices from real companies can can contribute to the to the blockchain yeah so both really bullish on real world assets on the on the blockchain and opium is also ready to if i say uh, i'm i'm a company i want to build uh, let's say I want to build something like Centrifuge. This could be built on top of Opium, basically, yes, right? Yeah. yeah. So Centrifuge is now built on top of Substrate, um, and uh, but they could also use the Opium as a tech stack, right? So this means that we will maybe see more and more companies starting to do that and start competing with each other with their own uh, derivatives, uh, and then Opium is like a base layer uh, uh, for that. Yeah, we were trying to build it uh, composable with the traditional financial system at first. Yeah. Because when we started to build it uh, That's a good two and a half years ago, it was no DeFi. So we couldn't build for DeFi because it was no DeFi back then. No. Uh, but we built it in, in, in the same terms, our uh, contracts, uh, kind of the same definition, uh, the same conventions and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that, that's that's advantage. Yeah, and so and you build the technology, and now when DeFi is coming, you, uh, you, you before the interview you speak about you want to give it to the community. So you want to give the the the. the you want to give it to community, of course, and that's I think uh, the trend. But it's a very good trend to mm -hmm. give the governance to the community, yeah. and uh, that's what Compound did uh, yeah. at first, and it shows that it works. Yeah, uh, people uh, understand that they now can own something more than just a Bitcoin or just uh, another token. They can own something which works by itself. Yeah. And this is pretty, pretty cool. And they can vote how to change it and they can completely change it. And they, they can uh, destroy it as well, but they can also build something cool. Yeah. But that's the, the community is deciding. And uh, that, that's, that's pretty exciting because it's first time I think in history uh, we see something like this. Yeah, and now the community is still like individuals like yourself, like myself, that are like very enthusiastic about decentralized finance and all these decentralized governance protocols. Do you see, I, I, when you're talking about Opium and, and the mindset, like we're building for traditional finance, do so you maybe see some bigger players like, hey, we want a stake of this network, like Aragon, Tim Draper put a, took a big stake of Aragon, right? I think maybe in the, we will see companies that want to use this protocol also take a big stake and then starting to be active and starting that's, building. That's, that's a very good question. And uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer. <laughs> because I've seen, uh, yeah, I was born in Russia, right? And, and Soviet Union. Yeah. And then uh, in 90s, uh, when uh, it was Russia, uh, and not Soviet Union anymore, all the communistic uh, pro uh, assets, they were given to people. Mm. So I don't know if you remember this. Everybody got small share, small voucher for for like part of the all the factories and everything of Soviet Union, and uh, it was pretty good idea. It's like Unis what Uniswap did. Yeah. They, they gave their shares to everyone who using it. Mm -hmm. So Soviet Union gave it to everyone, uh, all all the citizens. Ownership the, economy, I think. Ownership economy. But yeah. what uh, what happened? Uh, I remember I got one, and I was uh, what it was. Uh, Seven year old. Okay. Oh, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty old. You get so, it when you're seven years old. I thought only after eight. No, no, no. Every, everyone, everybody got everyone, it. Everyone, every everyone, child, every. Everyone got it. So, and I remember that 
and my parents got it and I remember I got uh, some what it was uh, like not Sony PlayStation back then but the small uh, Nintendo Nintendo yeah nice for it because I could buy it and, uh, <laughs> Oh, everybody I knew, uh, they, they did the same because, uh, and there, there uh, we come to the education point. Mm. Everybody did the same, and uh, people who are known nowadays as oligarchs, they basically were smart enough to buy it from people uh, mm. and accumulate it, and then they mm. became uh, factory owners, Uniswap owners. <laughs> that's 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 an interesting, interesting point because a lot yeah, of people yeah. who bought Uniswap they uh, were selling it immediately and uh, buying a new iPhone uh, stuff like this for it. Yeah, but if you look at the they have the PlayStation metrics now, PlayStation Five metrics. Exactly. That, How many PlayStation Five you can buy with? That's, that's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Multiplication. <laughs> Multiplicator. <laughs> so, uh, but then maybe they realized that uh, Uniswap is uh, doing pretty well, and those uh, governance uh, is, is is pretty uh, good to have. But that's and maybe it's going to be aggregated. In a, in a big bank, I mean, big big bank gonna buy all these uh, shares of Uniswap and uh, own Uniswap. It mm. may happen because I've is seen it good or is it bad? I've, se- I've seen it happen. Uh, mm. In uh, no, it's not good or bad, but it's against yeah. of the decentralization or community governance mm. and so on. But I've seen when I was a kid, I've seen it happen. I've seen it in the Soviet Union. It was an experiment in a big laboratorium of Soviet Union <laughs> that shows <laughs> how it is. And if you've seen in uh, many African countries. Uh, well, norm- not normally they called democratic republic of something. Mm-hmm. They all democratic. Yeah, and people got the, the same rights, but they traded uh, for the rice, for the chicken, for something. Uh, and my point that it, it is because of education. So uh, you need to give education first, and then people know what it is. The same with risks. And now we, we we're going uh, back to the regulation, to awareness. Should government control it? Should government not control it? Mm. But if we've seen uh, this is happening and it's pretty bad, so my point that you need not only regulation but education. And yeah. first, people need to understand what it is and uh, how what what is the risk, what is the benefit, and then they can decide. You cannot decide if you just uh, see a very small part of the picture. I see, and but I, I, I hear in general that you more for a model more of like an ownership economy than an oligarchy structure, right? So you more. Yeah, but how, how, to, how middle, to make sure yeah. that one is not converting to another? Because it's going to be very smart people who buy these Uniswap tokens now uh, from, from, from others. And, uh, no, then investment, they own no investment advice? Stuff. No investment advice? Never. Yes, <laughs> never investment advice. Everything we discuss is opinion, yeah, yeah, our course. opinions, of course. But, really yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, how yes. to ensure that this uh, system, uh, community governance, is not going to turn into oligarchy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know the answer. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting question. So like I also uh, work for a company at DeFi Capital where we basically have governance control. And I I think we see voting proxies going to exist and uh, there will be central points. And you already see that. Like if you look at Compound, if you look at Cream Finance, maybe you didn't know what happened there, but uh, there was one guy from FTX that basically deposited all his centralized FTX tokens, then started to borrow DeFi tokens, dump it on the market, take a short, and then uh, buy back, take a long, and do that all the time, right? So he was making a lot of money like that. So uh, how would you judge this? It's a very hard question. I We don't have a regulation uh, which says you cannot do it. We don't have a uh, mutual agreement that we say I, we I don't do it. I think right? you can do it, but what he did, with his, because he did it with his own centralized token, which he can basically print unlimited amounts of, I would say it's a little bit unethical. Uh, but that's that's uh, that's already regulation. That's what I say. So uh, mm-hmm. if there is no rules, you can do anything. Yeah, but, but he, c- certain things you do, you, you sound negative about it, and uh, I understand. Yeah. So yeah, but he is now also in the in the cream community. For some reason, FTX got listed. Nobody was really paying attention. Somebody was listed. So somebody had a lot of cream. Probably maybe somebody from FTX himself. They listed FTX. It started happening now. The community is a little bit. Hey, what's going on? This is pretty dangerous, right? If because seventy-five uh, percent of the liquidity on Cream was FTX, and it was very small, so they was only using it for buying DeFi, and then it was not used anymore, and then right. So if FT, let's say FTX dumps them like fifty percent, there's a problem because the FTX markets are very small. So that, then there will be liquidity crunch, and everybody 
of the cream protocol will have issue with that, right? Uh, and another question: Would it be possible in a traditional financial system? I actually don't know. So maybe you know. Well, you, uh, let me say for a lot of things which people are doing in DeFi, you would normally go to prison in traditional financial system. So and I, I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying it's good or bad. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't want to judge. Uh, I'm just saying uh, we are now in a phase of experimenting, mm -hmm. and I'm just saying uh, people need to be aware of risks. Uh, every time they want to run another two percent on, on top of existing twenty percent, twenty percent. So uh, they need to think what kind of risk I'm accepting. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 like a but, picking a cherry on a rail track. So you can pick a lot of cherries, but then the train gonna go and. Yeah, but for example, it. if you look at the ROI for using Uniswap, if you use Uniswap in September, your ROI on Uniswap is pretty high because you get this 400 uh, Uni tokens, right? I mean, you did, didn't really know, right? The same with DeFi. If you used uh, uh, Curve for, for a long time, and suddenly suddenly DeFi was launched for like one week, and then as if it was distributed, right? Uh, I think that's. That is pretty good, but we need to, yeah, and then you get things like what I think FTX is doing is a little bit, yeah, not adequate, but the community is now voting on it. But you can already see it's a bit weird, the voting numbers, right? So it's like somebody is buying up now a lot of cream, so the cream price goes up. So this is a whole economical, uh, yeah, mechanism behind it where you can also earn on that, right? So if you see there is a community uh, issue, you can buy cream because you know, okay, it's probably gonna go up because somebody's gonna buy a lot of governance tokens because they wanna get control over it. So I think it's a lot of cool games actually now. It's not necessarily good or bad. I, 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 don't, want, I, want, I don't want to judge. Yeah. I'm focusing on uh, our own things. Yes. And it's pretty enough. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a so lot. I, a lot I, I spent 200% uh, of my time on it. Yes, yes, so yes. So I don't yes, want to judge, yes, but uh, in, in general, I think uh, it should be some, some structure and some self-regulation, something like this. Otherwise, it's uh, always going to be a games and, and a big system, in a big mature system, uh, they, they will cause uh, and, uh, the end of the system. Okay, and uh, like uh, now with Opium, uh, we're going to uh, distribute the, uh, you're, you're talking about distributing it like more of like an ownership economy. So I, I hear that also maybe, maybe in the future, I think you're still constructing that, but also Opium will have some sort of a, distribution mechanism of, of value to users of the protocol, right? Or maybe? So, uh, a lot of people asking me about this, uh, about the Opium token, and uh, mm -hmm. if we're gonna have Opium token, but it's actually in a white paper, so which okay. is on a website, and it's described uh, the governance, so we want to give it to the community, Yes. so the Opium and uh, community will uh, manage it. Yes. So that, that's what it is, and the details are in a white paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much a compound uh, history, and uh, yeah. that was the first example. And you're yeah, gonna I iterate think it's, it's on this. Really you're gonna iterate. You're gonna iterate, make it better, and maybe yep, you're you're still exploring that. That is really cool to hear, and I think that uh, there will be a lot of usage for the for the opium uh, protocol, and hopefully also better. Yeah, community governance structures, right? Like if somebody is using the opium protocol in a way that it's maybe malicious for the rest of the community, then yeah, somebody should uh, like the, the vote, government vote for it. Yeah. Vote against, yeah, vote against it. Or if somebody has a good idea, they should of course vote for it, right? So, That's the ideal uh, scenario, yeah. Yeah, and let's not hope that everybody starts buying Playstations or Nintendos with their, <laughs> with their stick, and then we, we have a more of like a spread out uh, governance uh, system. Yeah, it's really interesting to see. Do you see, uh, a world where uh, also in, in traditional finance with creating exotic derivative products, you, 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 you told me, like an ex and an exotic derivative product is, what is an example of an exotic derivative product? Um, we have now one company uh, who built on top of the pro Opium Protocol, uh, Olive Oil Futures. Wow. So, and it's pretty, pretty exotic. Oli, uh, so again? Olive Oil. The, the, the olive Oil. Olive Oil, yeah. Ah, okay. The oil you put in the mess. The pizza. Uh, yeah. yeah, so because if you go to bank, it's going to be pretty expensive to, to settle something like this. Yeah, but a lot of companies need it because they trade to each other and they want to exchange those risks. They want to hedge the risks. Buyers, buyers and sellers, they want certainty. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that's 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 pretty cool case uh, to be uh, done in DeFi. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just need to uh, go through on ramp, off ramp, and uh, all the stuff with KYCs if needed, and so on. Okay. So, but otherwise, uh, it's it's very simple and uh, efficient. Yeah. And my, I like this example. I speak a lot about this example. Uh, it was some uh, articles about it and Coin Telegraph. I like it because it's completely out of DeFi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a real use case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty interesting. That sounds that sounds very interesting. With all of uh, so somebody's already using it. Uh, yeah, the root is for art. What we do now. Yeah. Um, the but the liquidity is still a bit of an issue because it's a lot of education, as you said, right? So for for me, it's is quite easy, or for other people in the crypto space. But it's a very niche market, right? So we need to. Well, it's it's a big niche, right? Uh, if, yeah. If you compare it with DeFi, I'm not sure what's bigger. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of companies they, they, they trade it and they, they don't need education. They just want to do, fix the future price of, of uh, olive oil. Do you think that uh, a decentralized financial system like Opium or something else can do like a vampire attack on a centralized finance? And what do you mean by vampire attack? Uh, basically, that sounds scary. Yeah, so well, what, what do you mean by this? It's a little bit scary, but like so, what happened with Sushi Swap? Sushi Swap forked uh, Uniswap so and then take, vampire takeover, basically take over, right? But so we, the stuff you go to prison in the real uh, no, 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 world no, no. for it. I yeah, pretty much. It, if I say I, I'm gonna raise money to take over Kyle M, uh, probably gonna go to prison. Okay. If All right. I, I, I don't know. If right. you're gonna be a competitor of KPM of K, uh, KLM, you can. I depend on the jurisdiction, but pretty. But I, I, I'm gonna, you can compete. Right? Sh no, no. If if I say I'm building this better system, if you come over with your uh, derivatives, that you, let's say olive oil derivatives. If they people that already trade olive oil derivatives in the centralized financial market, if they come over to this new market, they get bonus, right? Give them extra uh, lower trading fees, lower uh, everything. But the volume is so very low. But but if you offer them other benefits, you basically suck the liquidity out of the so centralized. But finances. centralized that doesn't exist in this case or in, in many cases. So okay. you only have it uh, very, very innovative directly because to build that that was my point to build some uh, very uh, small liquidity or very exotic derivative uh, in a traditional system and centralized system uh, you would need to comply to a lot of regulations uh, clearly define what it is it's going to be 200 pages legal uh, explanation what, what is derivative actually and what is in this case or what is that case and so on so on and bank, banks are suffering from it we yeah. speak to several banks uh, in, in Europe, but also in um, some other regions. They're suffering from it because uh, they need to describe legally uh, a lot of uh, derivatives they use. And if there is a small change, the lawyer is going to be busy and it will take time. And they need to make sure the regulations, but also description, but also consequences, and so on, so on, so on. And they're saying basically, hey guys, mm -hmm. can we use, can we white label uh, this decentralized system? We're going to put it uh, into, into bank, so under the KYC IML. Mm -hmm. But uh, the legal description is going to be simple. The legal description is going to say that you have this uh, product, the code is the law. Yes. Then they describe this idea and they say, okay, then, then it's up to you. So it's a bit different code. You don't need to make a uh, different uh, legal description of it. And th they can deploy a lot of instruments for their clients very fast. That's pretty interesting direction. That's amazing. And I, I think more banks and more central parties will definitely start to use that real, this more, more efficient technical real. You were like in the, when derivatives were a new thing, you were also like studying them already in the university, right? Like, because you do also the same thing in the finance, in the traditional finance system, derivatives were created. Uh, 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 the, 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 the famous like ch chicken nuggets story, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that somebody wanted to have the stable chicken nugget price and then started like trading, right? The, oh, I didn't know. No, I think uh, it was a little bit earlier here okay. in Amsterdam. Actually, it's the first uh, derivative exchange, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, just somewhere in. Not not far away from here. Interesting, but that, that's that's like uh, first derivatives probably come to the uh, price of the of the wheat of the, for the bread. Yeah. So I don't know how much uh, wheat I have after the summer because if it's raining, not so on so on, mm -hmm. and uh, the price can be high or low. Yeah. And uh, as a farmer, I want to fix it somewhere in the middle. But as a buyer, you uh, run into opposite risk. You don't want to 
uh, pay too much yeah. or too little. You, you just, it's not your business basically to uh, speculate. On, your business is just buy it from for the certain price. You know your costs. You know costs of the production. You just want to fix it as well. So and then yeah. uh, they made a forward forward agreement about this, and that was probably the first use case. Super and then that, that's a forward because it's uh, bilateral b between you and me. But well, also not that much regulations then, right? Uh, you can make forward agreements. That's that's easier. But yeah. what is different, uh, forward and future? Future is standardized. So mm -hmm. it's uh, because if different parties make different agreements, it's all disaster. Or very NFT. Yeah. Different. But yes. uh, future is standardized and uh, it represents small uh, portion and you can approximate with certain number of contracts you can approximate your risk i approximate my risk my risk and then we trade it's like a, a universal mean of exchange yes to cover certain risk yeah exactly and then and, and this is an amazing cool innovation that humans thought of like it's very innovative also for that time and then also the bank there was no regulations as well so they just started doing that yeah. and suddenly regulations came in and it started to become very tight because also there was some bad uses of these derivatives because some people are yeah, packaging things that are worthless in something that's worth something and then sell it for too much. That's a whole history. Basically, that's happening uh, still 2007, uh, 2008. Yeah. Uh, the regulation, uh, the thing that the regulation always come after something happened mm -hmm. and make another rule. And then uh, banks and uh, yeah, financial institutes, they are quite creative. Yeah, and they define another way to to abuse the system, and then the regulation come after and say, okay, this is also not uh, possible. And then uh, they always uh, one step behind regulation. Yeah, and because they make all these hundred rules, yes, the hundred rules I need to, need to stay in place, and it is sometimes maybe not very efficient. So, so will we see now also? Yeah, I should already explained with the all of oil example, we will see more traditional players moving into decentralized financial. I hope so, because, because, because yeah. for them it's cheaper, faster, easier, and yeah. so on and so on. So. That, is, that is very interesting. Yeah, let's let's look forward to a, to a future where we're uh, going to have like more efficient, more efficient uh, markets and where we can fully innovate uh, and be, uh, be, be free and have protocols that we have as a community ownership of, right? Because you're, you're building it, you give it. That's very exciting. People, people are, the ownership, it's the ownership economy, right? You know that... It's the, the, the it's a small stream of thoughts from like some people that it's a bit old already the ownership economy where you go to one coffee shop every day you get a share in that coffee shop and it's a whole it's a whole uh, or, or the same uh, burger restaurant it's it's quite an interesting philosophy uh, and let's see how we how that will evolve in crypto like and I like the job you do because you're educating people about it you uh, showing different cases you make educational uh, programs and this yeah. is pretty cool because again. You need to be educated first in order to make a decision yes. to do it. Otherwise, we're going to go to... And what I find really interesting is that we will get self-building protocols. Yep. Basically, Opium is now uh, basically your technology company building cool technology. But once you release it, it becomes a self-building protocol. Exactly. And that's mind-blowing. I think it's... Uh, and, and basically, I'm also basically a person that is educated about this space and now it's like self things building around me but it's always of course happening but i see now with for example rec television which is also a very a DAO that's 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 forming so very small but uh, very good content um and uh like it's it's building itself right it's it's people are incent i'm incentivized because i uh, was early in the market and i started just researching because it was my hobby and I always was interested in technology. And now I'm incentivized to go deeper because I actually get a value. I create value by exploring this uh, ecosystem. Exactly. And you as well. Yeah. You, you yeah. invested yeah, yeah, yeah. in the exactly. Ethereum ICO. Uh, and that's really uh, good, really smart. And then you saw it and you're now by the Ethereum protocol incentivizes you to build Opium. Yep. Uh, that's that's amazing. No, that that's that's exactly uh, you formulated. Uh, in in the current world, uh, your it doesn't matter so much if you are in a Silicon Valley or if you're in Amsterdam or somewhere in uh, China uh, or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's about your brain. Yeah. So if you if you smart enough, mm -hmm. if you 
can put yourself, study, and then there's the sky is the limit. That's, exactly. That's, that's pretty cool. And also with the ownership economy, when we become owners in each other's, like when we use certain protocols, we become ownership in these different protocols. That means that we're incentivized to uh, treat the things that help us with greater respect, right? I think, and, and help each other more and help the protocols that we use more. And I think we we'll go to a future where uh, things, people will, will in general be more open to help each other, I think, because of it. Because it's I hope all, so. I hope everybody. it's not going to be in, in the, uh, what it was, Nintendo story. Yeah. There is. Uh, I, I yeah. hope it's not going to be Nintendo story. Uh, I hope uh, educational uh, materials like you do yeah. and general awareness uh, will be there and it will will be successful. Yeah, and you also help me with edge cases. That's also again uh, this whole community is forming, and uh, yeah, let's 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 move forward. And I hope to uh, to f to find. Uh, uh, I hope to see open protocol release to the community and start even exploding and building itself into like this even bigger vision that you have for fun decentralized financial markets. And uh, yeah, where can people find more about Opium protocol, about yourself? Where can uh, opium.network, okay. opium.team, it's all there. Nice. And uh, where can people contact you if they want to? Oh, there's a Telegram community, which is uh, pretty active and Discord community. And you're also active on Twitter, right? Yeah. Me I, I love your Medium articles, by the way. So if you, you have... Oh, you thanks. That, that's, yeah. that's actually my favorite uh, pieces. I uh, yeah. write quite a professional type of analysis and I will do it more. Yes. And uh, as a community, we would love to incentivize you to do that more because I think it's, uh, it contributes a lot to the overall uh, maturity of, of the system. So thank you very much for that. And... Uh, well, follow, follow Andre, follow Open Protocol, and let's, uh, let's uh, see where this experiment will bring us. Uh, I'm very bullish. You're very bullish as well? Yep. Okay, let's build together and uh, see you in the next uh, interview, guys. Thank you very much. Like the video, subscribe, and uh, let's uh, educate each other and level up uh, in the financial, this new financial world. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.